and welcome to our online Bible study on the prophet Ezekiel. And today we're going to be looking at chapter 13. I am Pastor Mike Robelch, and I'll be leading this online Bible study on the prophet Ezekiel. I'm one of the pastors at Peace Lutheran Church in Pico Rivera and the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in North Long Beach. If you would like to receive copies of the outline prior to our study, please contact us by email at P-E-A-C-E-L-U-T-H-C-H at gmail.com or send a DM to either of our two Facebook pages. Please include your email address too so that we may email the materials to you. And as I said earlier, we are looking at chapter 13. And chapter 13 deals with God speaking about false prophets. And I've taken the, uh, the time to outline how this chapter uh, falls. And it overall, it's dealing with false prophets and false prophetesses. And in verses 1 to 7, God makes his charges against the false prophets. Then in verse uh, 8 to 16, he announces their penalty. Um, and the penalty comes in two phases or two sets of judgments. Uh, the first set comes in verse 8 to 12, and the second one, 13 to 16. Then he turns and gets into false prophetesses. And uh, we see the charges against the women prophets, 17 to 19. And then the penalty, again, has two phases. First uh, set of announcements is 20 and 21. And the second set's 22 to 23, which brings us to the end of the chapter. And with that, let's begin our reading. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy, and say to those who prophesy from their own inspiration, Listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets who are following their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, your prophets have been like foxes among ruins. You have not gone up to the breaches, nor did you build a wall around the house of Israel to stand in the battle on the day of the Lord. They see falsehood and lying divination who are saying, the Lord declares when the Lord has not sent them. Yet they hope for the fulfillment of their word. Did you not see a false vision and speak a lying divination when you said, the Lord declares? But it is not I who have spoken. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have spoken falsehood and seen a lie, therefore, behold, I am against you, declares the Lord God. So my hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and utter lying divinations. They will have no place in the council of my people, nor will they be written down in the register of the house of Israel nor will they enter the land of Israel, that you may know that I am the Lord God. It is definitely because they have misled my people, saying, Peace, when there is no peace. And when anyone builds a wall, behold, they plaster it over with whitewash. And you'll notice that I have uh, highlighted uh, the parts of the uh, thing in two different colors. The yellow is the uh, announcement against the false prophets. The blue highlights the beginning of the, uh, the penalty phase, if you will. And let's sort of take a look at, at this. Uh, Ezekiel's having another vision. Uh, Yahweh, the Lord, is come to him and says, I want you to prophesy to those false prophets. And um, I've also uh, bolded some of the lines here because I want to take a look at some of this. First of all, <clears throat> we say that these prophets 
who are false prophets have gotten their inspiration from their own heart. And in fact, um, in the NASB, they said who prophesy from their own inspiration. But in looking at the original Hebrew, it looks like the word that is translated as inspiration might better be translated as um, heart. So their prophecies are coming from their heart. And so what does that mean? These are prophet, prophet, prophets who are speaking their own word. What in essence they have, <coughs> excuse me, what in essence they have done is that they have placed themselves in the place of God. And they're telling the people, the people of God, who are looking to them as being leaders, to listen to me. And here's, I'm going to tell you exactly what you want to hear. And they're telling them what they want to hear. It's because that is coming out of their own heart. It's not what God is talking about. And God has some problems with the people of Israel and these false prophets. Now, remember that Ezekiel is talking to the exiles, people who have been pulled out of Judah and taken to Babylon as part of Judah has fallen. Jerusalem at this time is under siege, and God has sent two prophets, two legitimate prophets. He sent Ezekiel to be with the exiles in Babylon, and we know that Jeremiah, who is a contemporary, is prophesying to the people still in Jerusalem. Um, so, God saying, okay, these guys are following their own spirit, their own way, their own head. And he said, they're like, um, in this case, NASB said foxes, but uh, Strong's Concordance makes a very good argument to say that the animals should be jackals. And jackals um, are a, uh, a good vision, and it is used multiple times in the Bible, with jackals running around, meaning that there's chaos and death. Uh, a jackal, and I'll show you a picture here in just a minute, is a omnivore. It eats plants, it eats meat, it eats live or recently killed uh, animals. It also eats carrion or dead animals. Um, and God has said that I haven't sent these prophets. These are not my prophets. They're speaking their words and not mine. And now he goes into, because you have spoken these falsehoods, these lies, you have told these people that, you know, God is really for you and it's going to be all right. And that's not the message that God wants to take to them at this point. So God says to these false prophets, I am against you. And now, so my hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and divinations. Okay, remember, we've seen the hand of God before. Ezekiel said the hand of God fell on him in one case and was on him in another case as he was receiving visions. <clears throat> Here the Lord is going... He is taking up, he is laying his hand, or his hand is now against these false prophets. And here is the judgment that God is pronouncing on these false prophets. They will have no place in the council of my people, nor will they be written down in the register of the house of Israel, nor will they enter the land of Israel, so that you may know that I am the Lord God or in this case. Okay, so God has told these, these false prophets, you have no place in the council. You will not be giving prophecies anymore. But on top of that, 
You will not be written down in the register of the house of Israel. You will not be counted as a part of the people. You will not be a part of the chosen people. And furthermore, that wasn't enough. They will, know, they will not see the land of Israel again. They will remain in Babylon. Either they will die there or they will choose to remain there. But they will not go back to Israel. And then the final part is, you know, we see that God is talking about, you know, have misled my people by saying peace, and, and there is no peace. And I'm sure the people in exile were yearning for a time of peace because they had been, they had been overthrown. They had been uh, taken captive and carted off out of their homes, out of their land to Babylon. And remember that Jeremiah um, will be sending them a letter saying, in essence, to relax because you're going to be in Babylon a while. And in fact, they remain there about 72 years. And so let's continue to go on with the rest of the judgments that God has uh, given against the uh, false prophets. So tell it to, uh, to those who plaster it over with whitewash that it will fall. A flooding rain will come and you, O hailstones, will fall. And a violent wind will break out. Behold, when the wall has fallen, you will not be asked, where is the plaster with which you plastered it? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will make a violent wind break out in my wrath. I will also, in my anger, a flooding rain and hailstones to consume it in wrath. So I will tear down the wall which you have plastered over with whitewash and bring it down to the ground so its foundation is laid bare. When it falls, you will be consumed in its midst, and you will know that I am the Lord. Thus, I will spend my wrath on the wall and all those who have plastered it over with whitewash. And I will say to you, the wall is gone and its plasterers are gone, along with the prophets of Israel who prophesy to Jerusalem and who see visions of peace for her when there is no peace, declares the Lord. Now, there's a lot of, of symbology here. Um, for those of you that uh, perhaps grew up um, in the, the Southwest, um, a whitewash would be a coating that they sometimes put on an adobe wall. Um, the whitewash in and of itself does not have any strength. It is a coating, uh, like a paint. Um, and so what God is saying, you guys plaster th these holes in the wall with whitewash and fill it with stuff that is not going to help the strength of it. And so when a rain comes, it will wash away. It will uh, be consumed. And what God is talking about here is that a wall is for protecting a city. What has been protecting the land of Israel? And that has been God himself. God's covenant with his people, if we go back to, um, to our covenants, we remember, I will be your God, you will be my people. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. You know, if you follow my ordinances and statutes, the statutes being the Ten Commandments and ordinances, the Levitical law, I will bless you. If you don't, if you fall away, if you worship idols, I will take you out of the land that I have given you into a land far away. Guess what? We're there. But the wall that protected Israel was God himself, the covenant that he had. And these false prophets, and these people who have started worshiping false gods, the uh, Ashtoreth and Molech and whatnot else, sun god, I believe was one of them as well, they have 
they have torn down the covenant. They have walked away from the covenant. They have rejected the covenant with God. And even though the blessing and cursing, curses are there, they have chosen to ignore it. And we're going to find that that has a very, very real price. We saw that in the last three um, things that they said. They said, you're not going back to the land of Israel. You are not going to be accounted among the, uh, the righteous. You're not going to end up in heaven. You're not going to be part of the chosen people. And you're not going to prophesy. Uh, you're not going to leave Babylon. And it was like, boy, fairly heavy um, uh, judgments on these people. Now let's go on. Okay. You'll see on the screen in front of you a the typical jackal of the Mideast. A jackal is a canine that's related to the canine family. Uh, if you have ever lived in the Southwest or California, Texas, and you know up into Utah and um, New Mexico and, and the like, uh, you'll notice that there's a big similarity to coyotes and they are cousins. Um, they do similar tasks. Uh, they eat carrion, you know, dead animals. Uh, they clean up the ecosystem. They compete with food. Uh, a lion or a uh, tiger might kill an animal. And after that tiger or lion is eaten, the jackals will take what's left over. And that will be their food. And I want to bring up one thing because it was hit pretty heavily today. Uh, we talked about the prophets no longer becoming part of, no longer being part of the chosen people. In essence, this is also language of the end times. And I found this, um, this uh, meme out on the internet, and since we found it on the internet, everything out there is true, of course. Um, but this one is particularly true. And it talks about hell is not full of people that the Lord rejected. Hell is full of people that have rejected the Lord. And there is a distinction. There is a difference. God wants all his people to be with him in heaven. That is his deepest desire. But some people do not want that. That is, for lack of a better term, not their cup of tea. They don't buy into it. They don't believe it. They, you know, feel that they know better. And so they reject God and they go on and do their thing. And at the end time, when God is judging, he gives them what their heart desires. And that is, they want to be apart from God, and God gives that to them. Being apart from God, totally cut off, is what we call hell. So, with that, we'll go on into the second half of chapter 13. And now we're going to talk about, these are the charges against the prophetesses and what is going to happen to them. Now you, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people who are prophesying from their own inspiration. Prophesy against them and say, thus says the Lord God, woe to the woman who sew magic bands on all wrists and make veils for the heads of persons of every stature to hunt down lives. Will you hunt down the lives of my people, but preserve the lives of others for yourselves? For handfuls of barley and fragments of bread, you have profaned me to my people to put to death some who should not die and to keep others alive who should not live by your lying to my people who, can, who listen to lies. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against your magic bands by which you hunt lives where they're as birds and I will tear them from your arms and I will let them go. 
even those lives whom you hunt as birds. I will also tear off your veils and deliver my people from your hands, and they will no longer be in your hands to be hunted, and you will know that I am the Lord, because you disheartened the righteous with falsehood and did not cause him grief but have encouraged the wicked not to turn from his wicked way and preserve his life. Therefore, you women will no longer see false visions or practice divination, and I will deliver my people out of your hand. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. As we see here, the, uh, the sentence and the charges are pretty much the same. Here we don't see so much as that they're going to be cut off from the land of the living. Uh, we don't know that they are going to make it back to Israel, but God has pronounced them guilty um, for their falsehoods. And we have to remember that leaders in the church are held to a much higher standard than a normal, uh, a normal person. And by that, what I mean by that, it is as a church leader, as a pastor, as a uh, deacon, and as a um, uh, commissioned church worker, a DCE, or a commissioned teacher, we are held to a higher standard than somebody just coming to church. We are expected to tell God's people, the absolute unvarnished truth of what he is saying. We are not to soften it. We're not to make it harder. We are to be a conduit for God's word. Um, and I know you've heard many things in the news about ministers who might not have held up their end of the bargain. And, and that's truly unfortunate. It is not normal. It's not the norm for what you see on TV. There are many, many great pastors uh, and priests out there of many Christian denominations who do great work. But Suffice to say, when they do fall from grace, when they do sin, and they are not repentant, God will hold them to a higher standard than he does the rest of Christendom. So something to remember that your pastor or priest is under a lot of uh, pressure to deliver the word of God to you unvarnished and exactly how God said. Doesn't mean there isn't room for interpretation, but you know, it is something that we are held into account for. Now, the women had these veils on, and that was a sign of piety, and that's going to be ripped off for them. You know, that's going to be taken away because they have they have, they have talked to the righteous, the people who are still believers, and led them astray. And the shepherd who leads his sheep astray is not going to be held kindly when God judges him, because God looks at this uh, as a very serious matter. And in fact, I'm re uh, reminded of the parable where Jesus says, you know, if you cause one of these little ones to sin, it would be better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and be cast into the sea. Meaning that, you know, it is better for you to die than to lead one of these little ones, one of these children into sin. And that's something that, uh, you know, we should uh, all endeavor to is, you know, protect the children. Uh, somebody asked me not too long ago, uh, before I give a sermon, they will see me up at the altar and kneeling and I'm praying. And in essence, the prayer is pretty much the same week to week, but it is something um, along the lines of, you know, God, don't allow my sinfulness to interfere with what you want your people to hear. 
And I pray that every week. And it is something that um, I know that God hears my prayer. And I know that in spite of my failings, the people of God will hear what God wants them and needs them to hear. And with that, that concludes chapter 13. Uh, some people have asked, and uh, we'll make it known again, that yes, we do have in-person services and Bible studies. At Peace Lutheran Church, we worship at 9 and 11 on Sunday morning. Our 11 a.m. service is in Spanish. Our Bible study hour is roughly 1015 to 1115, and we're located at uh, 9412 Shade Lane in Pico Rivera, California. Uh, St. John's Lutheran Church, our worship time is at 1230. We have Maria uh, sign uh, interpreting for us. Our Bible study follows service at 1.30 to 2.30, and we're located at 6698 Orange Avenue in North Long Beach. Until such time that we see you in a service or a Bible study, I hope and pray that God will bless your study. And I ask uh, a favor of you, if you will, please hit the like button and subscribe and remember to check the bell so that you receive notifications when a new study or a new worship service is posted. May God bless you. Thank you.